You heard the title of this telecast. It was sort of inspired by something that happened to me when I was six years old. I was just beginning to be an altar boy. And uh, the pastor called me up to the altar. They were cleaning the church. And he said, uh, come, come. So I went up to the altar and he gave me a great big missal. It's a Latin book that we use during mass. And he said, go now to the back of the church and then into the rectory with this book. Well, it was very heavy for a six-year-old boy and, uh, and it was a long aisle. So as I got toward the end of the aisle, I began running, afraid I wouldn't make it. And there was coming into the church a woman uh, with a basket with bundles. One bundle, I remember, was potatoes. And I bumped into her, knocked her over, the potatoes, I fell over, and I fell in front of the big Latin book. And she said, why don't you read comic books like the other boys? <laughs> Well, that, that was my introduction to Come, Come, Go, Go. You could never guess what it's about. I will merely begin by saying that the world is rather divided into two groups of people today. There is what might be called the Go, Go group. And then there's the Come, Come group. The go-go group is the new breed. The come-come is the old breed. The go-go demand that we go into the world. We live in a secular universe. We must serve it. The come group is come apart. Get away from the world. It's wicked. Go, goes, God is dead. This, the world, is wicked and evil. This is the group that believes in the pendulum without the clock. And this is the clock without the pendulum. This is the flowing waters without a bed to the river. This is the bed with no waters in it. It would be wonderful if we could ever get the two groups together. And they, they should be together. Because when we go back to the life of our blessed Lord, we find that the first words of his public life were, come, come to me. And the last words of his public life where go, go into the world. Come first to get an idea, strength, inspiration, motivation, then action, dynamism, fluidity, serving the secular world. This is the way the two should be kept together. When they are kept together, what do you find? I think you get modern saints. I'm going to talk about modern saints, not plaster saints, not canonized saints, saints that are uncanonized, but rather those whom the world, not whom religion, those whom the world regards as saints. And their common characteristic is this. It's a, uh, it's a phrase from Thomas Aquinas. Contemplata alias tradere. In other words, go and give to others what you have already contemplated. First the come, the idea, the contemplata. Then the go, deliver it to others. 
Now, quite apart from any view that you may have concerning these whom I am about to mention, about their politics, their economics, their theology, or anything else, whom does the world, the world, generally regard as the four great leaders and saints? Gandhi. That's one. Two. President John F. Kennedy. Three, Pope John the 23rd. And fourth, Hammershold. Formerly of the United Nations. Each had a great idea. Each first came. They got some contemplata. For Gandhi, what was it? Nonviolence to others. But violence to self. For Kennedy, what was the great hidden idea and inspiration? We're going to call it the occult cross. John the 23rd, Love of God and neighbor. Hammershold interiority. Now the point is that these men were great, each and every one of them. Not because they started with the secular order, but because they started with a great inspiration, great idea, then activated it. Their ideas were motor motorized. First, Gandhi. I'm just looking at the clock to see how much time I can give each saint. I've got 15, 15 minutes, four saints. That'll be less than four minutes for each saint. I'm not going to have much time. So this will be the quickest life of the saint that you ever heard about in your life. First, Gandhi. Uh, the, uh, the great inspiration of Gandhi's life was nonviolence to others with violence to self. He said, after reading the Sermon on the Mount, as far as that is concerned, I am a Christian. He believes that one of the reasons people make war against others is because they've never been made war against themselves. So before he preached nonviolence, he was violent against everything in himself that leaned toward egotism and selfishness. When Gandhi was 37 years of age, he took the vow of celibacy. And he kept it until his death. And he said, I felt that any particular human love that I might have in marriage would narrow me. And I wanted to love all of mankind. And then another form of violence, fasting. Gandhi wrote better about fasting than I think any man in our contemporary world. He related prayer and fasting. Prayer, he said, attaches us to God, but fasting detaches us from creatures. And then he gave a new concept to fasting. He said, uh, fasting has great influence on those whom we love, whom we love. He said it will not have a great effect on tyrants, but it will on others. He wanted, first of all, by his fasting, to share in the hunger and the misery of his own people. And the only way that he could do this was by feeling within himself the gnawing pangs of hunger. And after he had conquered himself, then he began preaching nonviolence to others. And for what reason? For the sake of freeing the untouchable. 
those people of India that were ignored. One was not even to touch them. And he fasted to free them. And that Gandhi did. So his great contemplata was this idea from the Sermon on the Mount. On the Mount. Crush the ego. And then you'll begin to have influence on society. So it's first the come, come, then the go, go. And then the second President Kennedy. You know, I read, I read five or six books on President Kennedy, and none of them seemed to strive to catch the soul. What was it? The books that you read are only succession of events. It's very much like describing a violin solo by dragging the hair of a dead horse over the entrails of a dead cat. The soul is gone. What, what was the, the contemplata? What was the great idea? I think it was the occult cross. Something that one did not speak about. He knew what it was, he knew it from his faith, but I'm not speaking just of that. He had hurt his back playing football at Harvard. Then on August the 2nd, 1943, when he was lieutenant commander of a PT boat in the Pacific, a Japanese destroyer spotted them in the dark and cut the boat in two. One of the men were killed. In fact, all were announced later as dead. He was in the water 13 hours. But when that destroyer hit his PT boat, he was thrown flat on his back on the boat, and he said, now I know what it is to die. That back was a cross, a cult, came to no pain. Pain that wasn't to be spoken of. Two operations. Twice given the last rites of the church. Campaigning, he would sometimes go to the entrance of a hall where he was to lecture with his crutches and then throw the crutches down in order that no one would know that he was in pain. This was something to be hidden. Now what does pain do to make a man great? Well. Uh, Pain is a purifier. We get learning out of books, but we get wisdom from suffering. Never go to consult a man who hasn't suffered in some way. Pain is like the, the tightening of the strings of a violin. It produces better melody. Pain is like the hammer and the chisel hacking away great chunks of egotism and selfishness in a rock in order to bring out the form. Pain is the burning away of dross in order to reveal gold. And that pain and that agony, he continued, until the night before the cross became rather revealed in Dallas, when he said in a lecture, the old men dream dreams. And the young men see visions, as he put it in his inaugural address, as he concluded, on this earth, God's work is our work. This, I think, was the contemplata, the come, that made him great. For the Lord had laid on him his crucified hands and left the scars. Scars that made him great. Pope John. Pope John, well, he's simple to analyze. His the contemplata was simply love of God and love of neighbor. That's why he had such a wonderful sense of humor. He lived in two worlds. Love mankind. 
I remember he told me once, he said, my philosophy of life is never to make anything complicated. Make everything simple. But when he was a cardinal, for example, in Venice, sometimes the canals overflow. And this particular day, there was a heavy rain and the canals overflowed and the water was about six inches deep. He went into a wine shop and the wine keeper was a bit embarrassed to see the Cardinal of Venice coming in and he said, dry throat, eminence? He said, no, wet feet. <laughs> I, I remember, uh, I went in for an audience once with Karsh. Remember the famous photographer? And uh, Pope John posed the, for the photograph and then he turned to me. And he said, uh, he said, you know, listen, from all eternity, God knew that I was going to be Pope. He had 80 years to work on me. Why did he make me so ugly? <laughs> but this love of God translated itself into this, this beautiful dictum of his, namely, I love all humanity, and that's why I can never feel harsh toward any man. That's why I think he was the one to call the council. So he opened the doors of the church and brought the church out into the world. Brought the world into himself. Those great big arms of his were almost like those great columns of Bernini, except that they were fleshy, and he could, in a certain sense, embrace all humanity. And this was the one who made, who made men love one another. That was his contemplata. He first came. Come, come to me, all ye who labor and are burdened. He did. He came. Then he went. Yeah, because he had an idea, not just an action that turns into busybodyism, as it always does when one lacks a master emotion. And then finally, uh, perhaps the one who was least known of all, and one of the truly truly great men of our times. There was only one man, I suppose, who ever knew him. And that was Stolpe. Sven Stolpe. He was a friend of his youth and his associate during life. Stolpe has done the best work that has been written on Hammerschold, called Dag Hammerschold, a spiritual portrait. It was only to Stolpe and to his diary that he ever committed his thoughts, called markings. He said, I had to have a fixed point. See the contemplata fixed point. He knew where he was going. He said, there was a day in my life when I said yes to someone. And what was his characteristic? It was interiority. <coughs> An unseen spiritual existence that nobody knew about. When he was a boy, he lived intimately with the sorrow of his father. His father was a political figure. He suffered unjustly, labored under many false accusations. And in the midst of that, Hammerschold began turning to the scriptures. and saw that that was the life of Christ. That he had suffered and died in order to bring peace, peace to the world. So he began to think of how he could bring peace.
Stolpe says of him, he never married. Stolpe said he was the purest man I ever knew in my life. And he wrote three brief poetic lines about his chastity in which he said, Hidden away, the heat transmutes the coal into diamonds. What is a diamond but a carbon on fire? And so he said he felt that by not using this power, it could be transmuted. As he put it in another way, on another occasion, he said there's, there, there's there are various ways of getting with a great creative act, and one way, he said, is to. Not just the sexual act. It is one complete and total act of sacrifice. He prayed that he might gather his whole life up into one such brave moment of surrender. And before he left for the Congo, he, he wrote on his... He asked that a plaque be put up for those who give their life to peace. And 13 days after that, 13 years to the very day, he was killed. And he wrote something which sums up his life. He said, the road, you must follow it. The fun, you must forget it. The pain, you must endure it. The truth, you shall be told it. The end, you shall pursue it. These are our saints. The men who came first to God and then went. It does not require much time to make us a saint. It requires only much love. Bishop Sheen was a pioneer in Christian broadcasting. He produced thousands of radio shows and appeared on countless television programs. When he received television's Emmy Award, Bishop Sheen said, thank God for a good season. Did you notice that there was no interruption during this entire program? Do you know the only man that hates to be interrupted in the middle of a sentence is a prisoner? <laughs> and it happens that this is a program in which there's no interruption of a sentence either. Thanks for listening. Pay attention, therefore, to our sponsors. Bye now, and God love you. Fulton J. Sheen is indeed a man for all seasons. He walked a paced beat, allowing us to glimpse his nature and ponder its worth and to enjoy its presence. Bishop Sheen authored over 90 books. He broadcast countless radio and television programs and ministered in many parts of the world to people of every belief. As he said many times, it is not a unity of religion we plead for, but a unity of religious people. We may not be able to meet in the same pew, but we can meet on our knees. The bishop wrote 94 books recorded countless radio shows, and appeared on hundreds of network and syndicated television programs. His legacy is a treasure of joy that transcends time and helps us to believe that truly, life is worth living.